Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back again talking about tarpon. It's going to be a fun one. This has been a, a, a hot topic in the past, highly requested. We're getting into season and kind of a cool story about our guest, Captain Tyler. So Luke had moved to St. Pete area, kind of near that Eckerd College, Maximo Park area. And, you know, Luke's trying to figure it out. And of course, you know, we've got our insider community and super, super helpful. And it looks like, man, I kind of want to get in some tarpon. And you know, we're kind of just going through Instagram and we see our boy, Tyler, who we'd fished with before. We've actually chartered uh, Tyler in the past. And we're seeing him just like put up tarpon after tarpon after tarpon after tarpon. Like, what is this guy doing? And uh, so I'm, I'm really pumped to hear, uh, hear what you're doing uh, each and every year to be just so consistent. It seemed like you were on them almost every day when they were uh, there in St. Pete and Tampa. So I'm pumped to have you. So Captain Tyler Capella, we got Justin, head of tackle, and then Luke, who is at Little Gasparilla Island, very close. Oh, yeah. To Boca nice. Grande, one of the best places in the probably the world to catch tarpon, so, or at least yeah, used I'm to actually, be. I'm stocking up on pass crabs right now. They just started showing up, so I've got some in the live well. So I'm nice. ready for tarpon this year. I'm going to be taking notes on this uh, on this podcast. Cool. Yeah, yep. I, I used to fish down there quite a bit. It's it's good, but Sweet. I like it up here too. <laughs> and you got Wi-Fi at Little Gasparilla Island? Yeah, Island crazy. Things. We're really High coming tech. into the 20th century up there. Seriously. <laughs> I remember going there when uh you know you had to conserve water and stuff, and you know, you can only only flush them number two. That was part yeah. of the deal. <laughs> That's pretty primitive. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the real stuff here. So I, I think the best thing to do is just talk about the where, right? Because I think once you solve that, a lot of the stuff gets easier. And just let's just start with, you know, St. Pete, Tampa area, where you do a lot of your fishing, Tyler. Sure. Like, what the heck, what are you looking for? Like, what type of structure, you know, where in that massive amount of, of area, where do you where do you look first for tarpon? Sure. So um, obviously it varies quite a bit. <laughs> the tarpon are a fish that move around like an unbelievable amount. If you don't know about their life history at all, they, their migration is insane. First of all, they start life as little tiny plankton like this, literally hundreds of miles offshore. Some, sometimes they're getting carried around in the currents. They swim up during the incoming tide and they swim down during the outgoing tide because obviously they can't fight the current. So they keep doing that, get carried in slowly, get carried in and eventually uh, they'll find their way into these back little estuaries. Uh, golf course ponds are a big one. Like around here, pretty much any golf course around uh, around the estuaries are going to have tarpon in them because they swim in, get carried through the pipes, and they get in there. Um, and so juvenile tarpon live in these way backcountry kind of areas, even with super low oxygen content. Sometimes when a hurricane comes, you get a big storm surge. They'll, they say that, that somehow the tarpon know how to follow these hurricane storm surge tides and they'll get into areas that are completely landlocked and they'll, they'll live in there for years because they're one of the few species that can come up and breathe air. So they'll feed off of little mosquito fish and larva and stuff like that until maybe the next hurricane comes 10 years later and they get out into, <laughs> into, you know, the estuary actually. Um, so the juvenile tarpon, you know, once they, when they're like this big, they live in those areas up, up until a certain size. And then generally once they're about five, 10 pounds, They'll kind of move out into brackish water areas like Manatee River. Um, all of the rivers that drain into Tampa Bay are, are marinas. You'll find juvenile tarpon in that have a lot of brackish water, um, especially deep like kind of river bends or any kind of deeper pockets in there. You'll see them coming up and rolling. And once they hit about 45, 50 pounds or so, somewhere in there, maybe a little bit bigger, they'll join the, the actual you know, mature spawning migration of fish. And those fish, um, they're coming. So when they when they come into our area, basically they're coming from the south. So they're they're coming from even south of the Keys, Latin America, and they're migrating up as it gets warm. So you'll find them in the Keys, March, April time frame, which they're they're there big time right now. You'll start seeing them around Marco Island, uh, in you know Florida Bay, Marco Island, in Fort Myers, like mid April. You know, usually they'll start showing up there. And then, you know, once we start seeing them down in Sarasota, it's only, you know, a week or so before it's like the floodgates open. So there's, it, there's always a few that stay during the wintertime. So power plants, warm water marinas, things like that. 
once the water temperature, you know, you get those few warm days in March where the water temperature hits closest or 70 degrees, something like that. Those, the adult tarp and maybe the 2% that stayed um, will actually start trickling out. And if there's a couple areas like off the edges of big giant flats where the water goes up onto this flat and heats up throughout the warm days in the spring, and then it kind of drains off onto the side, that water will be four or five degrees warmer than anywhere else. And these early tarpon will kind of go in there and they actually lay up. So you'll see them like, you'll see the dorsal fin and the tip of their tail, you know, you'll be trout fishing out there and you'll see this like seven foot log just laying there. And if you know these areas, um, it's pretty like they're small areas. I'm not going to tell you exactly where they are. Cause it's like, that's a, it's a really like, you see one every couple hundred yards, but these are like the big, you know, hundred, 150 plus pound tarpon. And um, if you do do a little bit of research out there in the water and figure it out, you can you can start catching not, you know, not every day, but you can consistently like see these big fish and at least get consistent shots at them just about every day in March, you know, which is very early. Um, but as it goes March you know, into April, uh, more and more tarpons start kind of trickling in and they'll generally concentrate around the bridges. So bridges are a big one, especially, you know, we have the Skyway Bridge here. Um, and that's, that's a main early season spot, any, any kind of deeper structure in the bay, uh, such as bridges, even, you know, Port Manatee is a good area. It's got a big drop off there. Um, but bridges definitely, cause it holds lots of bait and the tarpon are just kind of moving around throughout the bay and then they'll just go and sit on the bridge and they'll just, they'll stay there and stack up. So you can just kind of work up and down the bridges and, and use your bottom machine um, look for the fish on the bottom machine itself. And then obviously look for fish coming up and taking aggressive air as they come up and roll. Um, and that's, that's a great time. You know, all the bridges around here, even, uh, you know, around Tierra Verde and um, over towards the beach and up in the Bay as well. All these bridges hold tarpon in April. Um, and, and so basically, you know, I'll we'll start fishing the bridges heavily. You can start catching them consistently, but that's more like you're fishing the spot. You know, you're not fi necessarily fishing the fish. You're going to the bridge, you're putting a bait out at the bridge and, you know, you're, you'll catch them, but it's not like, okay, there's 150 tarpon come right at us, like make the cast, see them eat it. It's a little bit different. So, um, but what happens in usually late April, if it's warm, early May, sometimes, and always by about mid-May is that main migration shows up from the South. So it's like, you know, there's a fair amount of tarpon in the bay, all, whatever, all through April. And then all of a sudden, literally like a light switch, there are thousands of fish like all over the place and they move into the area and they move around within the area. So um, it's not like they're just coming through from the south and they keep on going. It's like they come into the area and they move around with within the Tampa Bay area, in the bay, on the beach, around the bridges uh, throughout that entire time. So once that main migration does show up, there, you know, Bean Point is obviously a really popular spot. It's almost getting like it is down in Boca Grande, kind of where Luke is down there. A lot of boats, but it's, you know, that's the first entrance into the bay. So they're coming from the south and they just pile into the, to, uh, Bean Point down there at Anna Maria. Um, but, you know, my favorite way to catch them is on the beach. Uh, I can kind of go get away from everybody a little bit. You know, it's a pretty popular thing to do now as well, but you can go and on the beach and find your own pods of fish. So out of these main schools that are coming up from the South, different little pods will break off of these main schools and stuff and they'll start working up and down the beach. Um, generally in my area on an incoming tide, they're, they wanna go kind of North and on an outgoing tide, they're going South back towards the main pass. So, you know, the fish will work all the way up even past the Don Cesar and, and, uh, you know, work all the way up there. And then as the tide starts to go out, they know that those past crabs are going to be flowing. Um, it's just their instinct. They know it's going to be flowing out there at the Egmont channel and the major passes around here, passage key, and, and also being point and even the smaller passes as well. But those same schools, I mean, I've literally followed the same school from St. Pete beach all the way to Port DeSoto and like into the Egmont channel. They just, they, they know they all move that way. So, um, and that's my favorite way to catch them anywhere. You know, you'll see single fish sometimes all the way up to schools of 250, sometimes even more. Um, and that's, you know, six, 10 feet deep, about what, 100, sometimes just past the sandbar, you know, that second sandbar 
Uh, even the swim buoy line is, is a real popular area where the fish come through. Um, and you'll see them, they'll kind of just work down the beach. And, and if there's a pass, you know, you get the big shoal around the pass, they'll kind of, a lot of times they'll go right around it and you can, they'll get kind of squeezed. If there's fish near the beach, they're going to go around it. If there's fish a little bit more off the beach. They're going to kind of, they all get squeezed on the end of those passes a little bit. So that's a good high percentage spot. Um, and, you know, a lot of times also, not all those fish move up the beach. A lot of them, you'll get these mega schools of like, you know, 200, 500, sometimes a thousand plus fish that they move up into the bay on the incoming tide, almost all the way to the skyway. And then on the outgoing tide, they're, the, all they're doing is basically daisy chaining. They're, which a daisy chain is a tarpon talk for basically a big school of fish swimming in a circle tail to tail. So there might be 10 fish doing this or literally a thousand or, or like 500. And you'll, you can look and you'll see this big giant dark donut out there. And it's just a ton of tarpon doing this, you know, and the reason they do that is sharks are obviously their main predator. They got eyeballs on all sides. So if a shark comes, there's somebody's looking, you know, so they can spook and go the other direction. But anyway, so as the incoming tide starts, they'll move way up into the bay. And then as it starts to go back out, they'll kind of daisy chain and they're let, they're basically letting that tide take them as they daisy chain out to the pass. And then they get sucked out the mouth of the pass. And as soon as the pass crabs start flowing, they kind of feed their way back. They, they spread out. They're, they're no longer in a school. They all spread out along the surface and then, and they start feeding on all the pass crabs as they're floating out. Um, now you can catch these fish, you know, if you get, they're a lot harder to find, which is, it's, it's kind of a thing where, you know, it's a needle in a haystack, even though there's 500 fish they're they're in a really tight ball and they're in the middle of nowhere in the bay. They're not hanging on anything. They're just somewhere between Egmont and the skyway. Right. And there's a lot of water out there. Yeah. And the thing is, if you can find those schools, you know, you'll have a whole bunch of fish to yourself. And if you know how to present the bait properly, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, you can, you can catch them. And, you know, it's a lot of times, it's not just one school. There, there will be typically multiple big schools of fish, but they're not showing all the time. Like sometimes they don't come up and even, not even one fish will roll for 45 minutes, an hour or something like that. So you got to, you know, side imaging is key for that kind of fishing. If you don't have a side imaging sonar, it's, it's not impossible, but it's way more difficult. Um, because if those fish aren't coming up and showing, they don't just, you know, a shark might scoop them and then all of a sudden they move 300 yards over here and you're going to lose them on your side. You know, you, you're on the fish thinking you're getting baits back to them and all of a sudden a shark scoops them and they, and they're just gone. I mean, that's, they can be really tough to track even with side imaging. Um, the one thing like I just I keep talking about on these big schools, typically that's where the sharks are. You know, that's the, on the beach. When you get the schools moving up and down the beach, it's extremely rare. Uh, at least, you know, Mine and Egmont's kind of its own egg, uh, animal because it's right on the main passes there. Um, and the big sharks last year for the first time I've ever seen actually came up onto the beach at Egmont in like two feet of water every day. And we're like chasing tarpon around right where people were, were swimming. It's a little sketch, like hey. super sketch actually. Um, I, my trolling motor got attacked twice last year, but just not even, you know, just on the vibrations from the troll motor, a bull shark came up and, and whacked it two times. Uh, separate days so but up and down the beach you know typically there's no sharks but up in the bay those those schools are just getting shot there's big hammerheads and bulls attacking those schools um i'll talk about how to kind of avoid your, your tarpon getting eaten later on but um anyway so yeah it's a, three main areas are the bridges which there'll be tarpon there early all the way into the late summer you know when the tarpon start to trickle out a little bit and July, August, uh, there's still some tarpon at the Skyway. Um, and typically, you know, the, the, this peak of the season is generally like somewhere between the latest part of May and mid-June is when we see the most amount of fish. Um, and that's, you know, if you're fishing the beach and you could sit in one spot all day, I like to kind of hunt them down and go because they may not be there for a few hours. But if you're sitting in one spot on the beach, you can see 2000 fish plus coming by, you know, here's a pot of hundred, here's a pot of 50, here's a pot of 200. And they just keep on coming when the, when the tide's right. Um, so it's like the beach, 
uh, the main passes and then up in the bay, those are two, kind of two different animals and then the bridges. So really there's, there's four main areas and each one's got its different techniques and quirks to catching the, catching the fish. Um, like I said, June, sometime between mid-May and early, early June, somewhere in there, sorry, late, late May through mid-June is when I'm at, um, is peak. And then they'll start to, they start migrating out of the area, start migrating north a little bit. We'll still have a good amount of fish all the way into mid-July typically. Like I'll tell you, usually June is the best month. Last year, July was the best month. Um, we had that weird Saharan dust thing going on. It was like crazy hot. Uh, we had a lot of fish, but the water in the Gulf is like 93. It's like, it was like 92 degrees. It was insanely hot. Um, so once it started raining in July, we still had a ton of fish around. And I was, I got more double digit days in July, like, you know, hookups than, than we got in June, which has never happened. But so, so they're weird. They move around. It's all kind of generalities when you're talking tarpon. It's not like, okay, this is how, you know, this is what they're doing today. They're, they're weird. They're the quirkiest fish out there, um, which is what makes them so cool to catch because when it when you, you do hit it right and they're going off it's like it can be insane um let's let's talk about that yeah. and, and let's stick to the beaches because i remember yeah. last time luke we were down there at boca grand we found the fish remember like they were daisy chaining like school after school and it, it's funny you mentioned that tyler like, we saw one dude oh man he's just sitting there anchored up he knew the little you know channel the, the little path they were taking like he was he was just right on he was just waiting for the fish to come and then we're chasing them all around and like, it was one of the most frustrating days ever. And that was like my last memory of last yeah. summer. What, what are the mistakes? Like what, what, what do you do when that happens? When you're finding them, it's, you know, somewhat clear day. You can see them down there underneath your boat. What, what are the mistakes in terms of positioning and approaching them to, sure. to, you know, presenting the bait, et cetera? Well, sure. So was that in June by chance last year when that happened to you guys? I believe yes, Father's Day weekend, I believe, which is uh yeah, which is June. I think okay. that was when that was that frustrating day. The one oh the yeah. I, I had multiple yeah. frustrating days. Uh, oh yeah. That was a that was bad. We're with our dad, like Father's Day, and like sure. We were, well, like, I'll tell you, I mean, uh, I'll tell you what. So it wasn't just you guys. The uh last year in June, like I said, we had that weird weather anomaly. Um tar there's something about tarpon and humidity, whether it's low pressure or just humidity itself that they love, right? So I, I've always said it's kind of like it, I, I've noticed it when it with little tiny tarpon. I've fished a couple areas where there's a lot of tarpon like this. They may they'll be rolling around. They might bite a little bit. As soon as it starts raining just a little bit, those tarpon get happy. Like, you know, happy tarpon. They'll start rolling around a lot. They'll start eating little bugs. You start seeing them splash around, and then boom, boom, boom. You can start catching them one after the other. So th I think what it is the rain. I'll, I'll get to the point in a second, but the rain kind of washes in bugs gets all the little creature, you know, creatures in these estuaries kind of fired up and that gets the tarpon, the little tarpon, it's like a Pavlov's dog. You ring the bell, the dog salivates, right? It starts raining just a little bit or even a lot, the tarpon go crazy. This behavior seems to tr like, go, this is just my theory, but this behavior seems to continue throughout their entire lifespan, right? So when I've seen adult tarpon before where, you know, it's a hot day or whatever, not biting, tides whatever whatever the tide's doing all of a sudden you'll get a little pop-up rain storm like you do in the summertime and it just starts sprinkling a little bit you know all of a sudden the tarpon start rolling around they get happy they're like and it's just a little bit of rain like not it's not changing the salinity it's not changing the temperature it could be cloudy all day and they're not fighting and all of a sudden it starts raining and they start fighting there's there's something about the rain that gets tarpon fired up not necessarily like a freak thunderstorm, you know, like you get those big pressure drops and like the temperature drops 30 degrees, that kind of will turn them off for a little bit. But if you just get that nice little light rain or even like after a mean thunderstorm and it's just kind of raining a little bit, the tarpon love that. So what you were, we're talking about last June, it was normally when it gets hot in June, it's, you know, 92 degrees, then the clouds just go like this and just rain hard, right? And then the tarpon will feed. Well, last June, we had that Saharan dust in the air and it was very dry, right? Very, very dry. It was so hot. It was just the, that dust was not letting any clouds form. And well, there was a three week stretch in June, which is right which, when you guys are talking about right in the middle of it. There were a ton of fish around, but they just were not wanting to bite. I, I was out there all day, like 10, 12 hours a day. 
And we were struggling hard to get like two or three bites for a lot of these days. Um, which, you know, typically in June, as many fish as we saw, we should have got 10, 15 bites a day. There were tons of fish. So it wasn't, don't feel bad. It wasn't just you guys. Like everybody was, even all the, all the captains stuff were struggling. But even when the bite is tough like that, there are things you can do. Like I said, I was still getting some bites. Um, so what, what I was doing when the tarpon are, are like that, first of all, a lot of times it's nighttime. They, they can see really well they'll feed heavy at night. I heard it was just, I didn't fish at night because I was just doing day charters, but a lot of guys that were fishing the bridges at night. If you get these really hot days, it doesn't rain for a period. You can go hit the skyway at night or go hit other spots. And it's, it was supposedly going off because they had to feed sometime. Right. Yeah. I was on, I was on them from six 30 in the morning until like eight 30 at night and just barely getting bites, you know, but um, what I was saying is, what you can do on these days that it's really tough. I mean, you can downsize, downsize your, your tackle. Um, I I'll even go, you typically I'm using 60 or 80 pound leader. Usually 50 is stretching it. And I'll go as low as 40. Sometimes just to get bites. You might, you know, you might break a fish off, but it's better to jump a fish than not, not get a bite. Um, and I, I use, you know, the FG knot and a big, long, long leader typically. And that's anytime when I'm fishing the beach, use, you know, 10, 12 foot leader. Uh, um, and it's 60 is typically what I use, but they, you'll see the tarpon, you'll see them do this. They come, here's your bait right here. I'll go the whole string of tarpon will go whoop, right around the bait. And here's a hundred fish just going like this right around your bait over and over and over and over again. And a lot of times, you know, it's frustrating, but you just have to pound them. You just got to pound them. It's like all of a sudden, after two hours of that, one will turn around and eat it, you know? And it's just, it, you're like, man, they're just not biting today. You just have to just believe the next one's going to bite, you know, keep pounding. Um, an, another one thing that I do though, is when they're doing that is I'll switch from past crabs. They'll eat, they'll eat a crab when they're hungry. If they're hungry, they want a crab. But when they're not hungry or they're, they're kind of finicky, a, th a live thread fin, will get in there and start doing this and they don't even want to eat it a lot of times. So you'll get a lot of hits where they come up and go, bah! they'll just like, they just want to kill the bait. So you'll get, you'll get the, you know, you'll see the thread fin out there freaking out. You'll see the tarpon flash on it. And then you're like, okay. And you're waiting for your line to go and you reel and nothing happens and you'll get the thread fin back and it's just smushed. It's like just scaleless eyes popped out like dead because the tarpon just came up and went, Bah. and and that happens it happens with all other species as well but especially tarpon so but at least you know if they'll do that the bait is in their mouth for a second and sometimes on the way out the hook will just get them and it's it's just a pure reaction strike like they just want the bait out of their area they're not they don't want to eat it but they just want to kill it and that's a good way you can get reaction strikes from a thread fin because a nice lively thread fin is doing this and it just triggers something you know triggers that reaction rather than a, a crab just sitting there they're just like nope sometimes like you guys saw <laughs> and i saw plenty of times last year um so i'll go down on those crazy difficult days on the beach i'll you know get a threat uh, and make you got to make sure they're like lively as well you can't just get one of those that's been alive over a while it's kind of like uh, you gotta it's, a, it's there's a difference between alive and lively so i always say you need that lively, fresh thread fin is going to get hit 10 times more than, than one that's kind of half dead. And, um, you know, if, if there's a big daisy chain in school, just float that bait right in there. There's, there's definitely a technique to that as well. So you get the, the, the school is they're either going clockwise or counterclockwise. So if they're going like this, I don't know if you can see my hand gestures here, they're kind of coming this way. You want the bait to be basically so they're seeing the bait first, right? If, if it's on this side of the school, you're lining the fish first, if that makes sense. Because the fish are coming from over here, your line is coming from, from this direction. So in this direction, they're going through the line to get to your bait. And a lot, you know, they can see so well, they, they can actually feel the line as well. It's not just sight, they can feel it. So if they're coming from this way into your bait, if the tarpon is heading away from you at all, it's almost, I mean, it's worth a cast because sometimes they'll hit it, but it's the fish that's coming at you. If you got a bait going this way and the fish is coming at you, the first thing they're seeing is the bait. 
So that's, that's a huge, huge thing. If they're going like this away from you and you throw this way, you are way less likely to catch one than because, you know, a lot of, I see guys on the beach. This is a good mistake all the time. And it's, I'm like, well, they're not going to, they're just scaring the fish. They're not going to catch them because if, if the school is here moving away and you see it, you'll see a boat behind them casting into the school. All you're doing is lining all the fish and you're pushing it with the boat. In that case, what I would do is go up here, get in front of the school, get a bait into them. So the first thing they see is the bait. That's like a, it, people just say, oh, they're the tarpon. And they rush over to them and they make a cast into the school. But you got to like slow down, just take a deep breath because I know it's exciting and go get in front of the school. And, you know, and, I, and I'm trolling motor, I'm using the trolling motor away from the school. So I'm almost slow trolling or, I'm, you know, they move pretty fast. Typically, the worst thing you can do is, is have the school come right under the boat. It's, it's like once they see the boat, you're way, they can still hit. You know, I, I've literally accidentally run a school right over with the boat, turned around and thrown in there and caught them when it's good, but it's not good all the time. You want to give yourself the best shot. So that's, that's a huge thing is making sure, making sure that the bait is the first thing they see, like straight perpendicular is okay. Even a little bit more, but once you start getting where you're, you know, they're going through the line, you're pretty much out of luck that way. Um, yeah. That's a good, yeah. a good tip for everybody. Yeah. It's just, you made you know, that mistake. Yeah, we yeah. were uh, we had the troll motor down. We were trailing them, slinging uh, slinging lures and even baits and uh, and even on the daisy chain too. We were casting right in the middle with the assumption, yeah, they some, something's got to see it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, they saw yeah. it all right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's that, and that daisy chain. It's it's critical to get as they're coming around. You're just just on the outside of that school as they're coming around this way. So it's like you always want the bait like right here in their face, moving away from them like that. That's yeah. how they that's how they want it. That's so their yeah, so you have to figure out which way the daisy chain is kind of shifting along and get yeah you just figure out which way they're which way they're turning you know it's either one way or the other if they're in a daisy chain it's a circle so you, you always want to be on that side where they're coming right into the bait rather than lining the fish that's that's a big one i mean hey tyler i actually had a question for you uh, especially mm -hmm. when fish are daisy chaining because the presentation for that is you know I've tried uh, in years past, I've spent my whole life trying to catch tarpon. It's one of my favorite fish mm -hmm. and it's, it's, they are the most frustrating mystical wizard fish you will ever come into because they just, for sometimes for no rhyme or reason, they don't bite. And I remember one day out around Anna Maria, around Bean Point on the beach, the sun's really high and you can see the black shadows of a hundred fish daisy chaining and milling around. And it's kind of like a, like a, like a school of ants that are just kind of moving around on the beach. Sure. And when they would daisy chain, I flipped, I think, three different baits in and around the daisy chain pod, crabs, threadfin, I even sabiki cigar minnows out there off the beach, which was pretty cool. And the only way I was able to get a bite is if I chopped the tail off of a fresh bait and flipped a, a fresh live bait dead, like out around the daisy chaining school. And over time, they wouldn't spook or be bothered by a bait fish that's swimming around and aggravating this daisy chain school. And eventually one would pick it up off the bottom. Yeah. Uh, it was something different that I didn't see anybody else try and didn't know if, you know, when you find picky fish, I'm sure you're going to go into it, kind of some techniques and tactics you have to, to get a bite when the traditional means of live bait and leading a fish isn't working out for you. What unconventional things have you needed to do to, to be successful? Well, sure. So I'll tell you around Bean Point in that area on the big shoal down there. Um, it's really weird. So the last, the last really 10 years, I've been a guide for almost 12 years now. So, uh, when I first started guiding and I, you know, there were a lot of fish down at Bean Point, just all over that shoal, everybody was going out there and just chumming with white bait, like you would but for snook, right? Like live, live white bait or live thread fin, which was really cool because then all the tarpon were, would spread out and like start blasting the baits all over the place. They were skyrocketing like kingfish and like that. And a, a lot of guys, for whatever reason, I guess just because it's easy, it's easier to keep the bait alive, whatever. A lot of guys started using cut bait down there. So they would go to cast net, you know, two five gallon buckets full of thread fin and, and chop them up, get in front of the school and start dropping all these baits back. Now that's what everybody does down there um, and on the point and stuff down there. And so these, these fish are just like trained to eat a dead bait down there. The water is super, super clear. Also like the, the water is very clear around Anna Maria. It's the clearest water we have. Um, and, you know, they, they used to smash a lot of bait down there. I've caught very few on crabs 
down there. It, unless the crabs are really flowing out of that pass big time, you might as well not throw a crab at bean point. They just, they don't even look at it. It's, it's really weird. Now the same fish, you move up the beach towards Egmont. It's about the beach at Egmont is about 50, 50. It's like half thread fin, half, uh, you know, half crab. And then once you get north of there, unless it's a really tricky bite, like I mentioned, I'm almost using exclusively crabs up and down, you know, Fort Soto, Shell Key, St. Pete Beach. It's, it's funny. And, and they just, what, for whatever reason, I think it's just because that's what everybody throws all the time. These fish are used to eating dead baits. Um, you know, you got, you got a hundred boats out there some days chopping baits up, throwing dead bait in the water. So that's, that's probably what it is. They're also, you know, they get heavily fished by the time they are hitting us, they've been hit all the way from the keys all the way on up here. So, and these fish, some of these tarpon are, are 50 years old. I mean, they, they live a long time and what, what they can remember and what they can. And so that's for the tarpon to know, but, um, they definitely are heavily pressured. And, and so I, I think the, the dead bait thing, a lot of it is your line is, is on the bottom, you know, and it's also got all that scent and things like that. So they can't necessarily sense your line looking down They're They're, everything on the tarpon is designed to look up, but obviously they'll, they'll come up and they, I've seen them suck a bait. They kind of turn their side and they'll suck it right off the bottom like that. Um, there's something about the dead bait down there that they really love. And of course, if you can get in front of a big school of fish down there and just, you know, ch start chopping up baits, you know, put your troll motor on, on anchor mode or anchor up in front of them and just start chopping up baits and drift these baits back into the big schools. Then all you do is you, you take, you know, you cut the thread fin at three, four pieces at a time. So you got lots of pieces of chum and then I'll put half a thread fin or even a whole thread fin and cut the tail, just like what you're talking about and just kind of you free line it. Right. So you don't want to just open your spool and let it go back into the school because that, that little bit of resistance is causing it not to sink with the rest of the chunk. So it doesn't look as natural. If you're actually, you'll see the guys when you, if you go down to fish bean point, they're pulling the line off of the reel real fast so it's going faster than the current is going that way that bait is just is just free drifting right with the current and all the other chunks all together and i mean you're sometimes you know especially in the past every you know you'll see the boats like lined up there'll be 30 boats like or more than that sometimes and they're like almost rod tip to rod tip just like in both grand pass but everybody's chunking baits or in front of the school chunking baits back you want to free line those baits back like almost where you got like half a school of line left or even less. I mean, you're, you'll, I let it drift back a hundred plus yards. A lot of times you're drifting it way, way back, letting that bait just go along the bottom all the way. And all of a sudden that line starts flying off the school, close it up, boom, you know, and you know, you got them. Um, so that's, that's the way to do it down that. And that's only down there. Like I don't use that technique at, except for uh, the skyway, the skyway that also works really well, chunking, you know, getting in front of a stall on the skyway bridge. And throwing baits back that's a really good way to do it there as well but up the beach in st pete beach or whatever like i've seen guys try to do it around egmont it just doesn't work i don't i couldn't tell you why i mean they'll eat a cut bait i've, I've seen guys you know that no one's really throwing ch like chumming hard around around st pete beach and a little bit north of there it seems to be that it's just the way the fish set up is the way to do it around bean point i and that's uh, you know, it works. It works really well. It's not hard to do. If you just set up, throw a bunch of chunks back and you can just drift baits back in them. It's just not, it's not my favorite way to catch them. You know, it's, it, it is definitely effective and I'll do it. If that's like the only, if there's a bunch of fish down there and that's like, you know, you know, you can go down there and get them when there's, it's kind of sparse everywhere else. I'll go down there and I'll do that. But it's, again, it's, I, I definitely like to fish the fish. Like I don't cast a lot of times, on the beach, you don't really cast until you see the fish coming. And that's more sporting. It's a more, you know, casting a single crab to a, a school of fish, making a good cast, watching them eat it is, is way more sporting than dropping a chunk bait back, which, you know, it, trust me, I do it. It's just, uh, it's messy. It's like, you know, there's a million boats everywhere. You're getting snagged on other people's lines sometimes. And it can be a bit of a nightmare, but, <laughs> but it works. So what's um, what's your rig look like when you're fishing the beaches there um meaning are you, what size hook you already mentioned a pretty long uh usually 60 pound leader what's everything else look like? yeah. you know, down in book grain so, you got corks everywhere when you see all the guides going out there yeah. fishing the beaches sure so 
you know, the cork is more to present the bait rather than as an indicator of a strike, you know? So it's kind of just to keep the crab or the bait fish where it is or keep it off the bottom. Uh, a lot of times if the fish are kind of riding high, I mean, I'll put the bait like literally two feet under the cork, like right there underneath it. Um, and, you know, I, I'll use, if they're spooky, I'll use a natural cork rather than like a bright orange thing or whatever. Like, you know, it's just so it looks like a piece of floating debris in the water. So it's less visible to the tarpon. Uh, you know, my philosophy is less is more. A lot of times the less, uh, you know, no swivels and no, like none of that stuff. It's just a little cork and then a piece of light leader and a hook. There's not, none of this other stuff on the, on the entire rig because they can see. Um, and that's other, you know, also a weak point in the line, but I got a, I got a little hook right here. So this is, you can see it. That's just a, that's an eight dot demon perfect circle by Mustad. If you notice, this is a cool little trick. I do this for all of my stuff. That's a little uni knot tied onto the hook right there. If you can see. Yeah. Um, so have you guys ever seen that before? It's like all, but basically what that is, is when you, I'm sure you've come across when you, if you use live bait or crab or whatever, you'll put it on there and the bait will slide all the way up the hook and rehook itself. And then it's spinning on the way in. Even if you do get a bite, the hook point is buried in the bait and then you don't hook the fish. Right. So I just, I cinched down a uni knot. I've tried like rubber bands and beads and all this stuff like that, but they don't seem to work very well and they don't last. So a uni knot, there's always leader available on the boat. I'll just put like a piece of, you know, 25 or 30 pound test, just cinch that thing down. It, it slides up if you, a little bit, if you want to move it, but just keep it right there in the bend of the hook. And that way that thread fin has to stay right there basically. And that's, I mean, that's going to like, half of your baits will get jacked up if you don't put something on there and then you're burning fishing time you're missing bites so this is a really simple like easy tip this is for snook fishing like any type of fishing i use it on my stinger rigs like whatever if you're using a live bait i always i i just started doing this a couple of years ago i finally like figured it out but yeah it's like god what can i put on here like beads whatever it's like so it was so frustrating, constantly wasting your bait and missing bites and like having to reel it in, especially for me dealing with, you know, up to four people on the boat at the same time. Like, so that, that's a really good tip, but, um, is, is that just regular mono or mono? Yeah, whatever. I mean, I, I always, I have fluorocarbon on the boat, so, uh, that's what I use, but, um, yeah, 20, 25, 30 pounds, the thicker stuff, I don't use like 60 or 80 for it. It just seems to be a little bit too big to really cinch it down heavy, but yeah like 25 or 30 seems to be really good. That's a cool idea. Yeah. I've seen the, you know, I've seen people use rubber bands and there's even, you know, rubber products made for it. But yeah, that's, that seems like a, a really smart idea. I've never, I've never seen it before. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of like, I don't know. I figured it out one day. <laughs> the uni knot is king. Like I've used yeah you know, glow, glow beads and stuff and that's okay. You got to find the right size. They're not everywhere. That's so convenient. Like I, yeah. the uni knot thing makes so much sense. Yep. Yeah. Just cinch it down, pull the tag in tight and you clip it right there and it's you're good to go you know Ooh. um so yeah i use you know this is a, this is an a dot which is what i use for 90 percent of what i'm doing uh tarpon fishing um and it's you notice it's not a big thick hook it's pretty pretty thin wire um i think i think it's just it's not even like a one x i think it's just the regular um you know tar even though tarpon's a big giant fish you don't want to use one of those really thick hooks because their mouth is so crazy hard. It's like the hardest mouth on a fish that I, I, that I know of. I mean, I can't think of another fish that has a harder mouth. And half the time that hook's not even, it's not even penetrated their mouth. It's literally just sitting, like sitting in their mouth like this. It's not, it's not actually through. So you'll go through the whole fight and that hook is just dancing around in their mouth the whole time. You know, that's basically why it's critical to keep the tension the entire time. And that's any fish. You want to keep tension on the line when you're fighting a fish. If the fish comes at you all of a sudden, you have to reel super fast. If it, you know, if they come at you and you let it go, a lot of times, whoop, and no more fish. And all you had to do is reel. Um, I've seen like the hook point will be just straight sideways like that when you reel it in, which is, you'll still catch them and it'll fall right out when you grab them by the mouth. Um, so anyway, that's dot eight dot hook like there always tie that on crab it's not so big of a deal but definitely you know we use pinfish sometimes if, if they're not biting a thread fin i've thrown like the middle of, like 50 boats i put a pinfish out there and, and whacked one when no one else is catching them 
they eat pinfish. It's kind of like a, a thing that people don't normally use. And then, so this is the, the setup is right here. This is a, you know, this is an eight foot rod. This one's by St. Croix. It's a, I don't even think they, they started, they stopped making these just last year. They have a new line, but this is the Mojo, Mojo Salt. It's eight foot, um, you know, it's rated for like 20 to 40 pound test basically. It has a really stiff butt, like that's really stiff, but I like I like to use a rod with a nice light tip. So if I can get a little cramp in here, but this tip is pretty light. It's uh, that way, that's, that's your shock absorber basically, is that, you know, tarpon can shake their head more violent, violently than just about anything when they come flying out of the water, bah, 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 bah. like just crazy, right? So that little light tip is your shock absorber right there. If you have a really stiff rod, that's more like taking your line and going like this. I mean, if you think about it, and this is why you bow to the fish as well, because it's another common mistake. You always hear bow to the king, right? It's when the fish comes up and jumps, you're supposed to point your rod as far towards the fish as you possibly can to give it just a little bit more slack, which is like the typical, the typical technique. The reason for that is the fish comes up and goes like this and they shake their head so violently you know, a lot of times, think about what you do when you're snagged on a dock. You go like this, you try and pull it like that, right? Because you're going no tension to extreme tension, like really, really fast. It's, it's exactly what a tarpon's head is doing like this. So if you can point the rod at the fish and give it a little bit more slack, it increases your chances of the hook not falling out rather than if you have full tension. Um, the problem is what I see people do all the time is as a, as a fish surges, right? So typically he's sitting there fighting and then he's gonna take off and then they jump, right? So once, when the fish surges, people will dip towards the fish as he's running really fast away and then the fish jumps. So they're already almost pointed at the fish mm. when it jumps, so they can't, they, there's nothing for them to bow to, you know, there's no more give. So I always tell my people, you know, when that fish is surging, I mean, I have the rod like way up, like past 90 degrees above my head, you know, fighting him, pulling up. If he surges, I really keep it up here high. I'm not pulling back on him necessarily, but just like keeping it up super, super high and keeping that rod really, really bent. That way, when he does come out of the water, you have maximum, maximum, uh, you know, release and tension and the maximum distance to bow. Because it happens all the time. If, if you're pointed here and he jumps and you bow to here, you're not doing anything. You're not really doing anything on the fish. And that's like a super, super common mistake for, for people. Of course, your first tarpon or your first couple tarpon, the thing jumps out of the water and you're just going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the whole bowing thing is going to go out of the, out of the window. But once you kind of get the hang of it, you know, that's, that's a big one. And again, it's keeping that rod super, super bent bring it way back you know if the fish is way out you definitely want to fight the fight the fish with the buddy or rod and not not with the reel not just trying to crank them in cool so, and then uh to finish the rest of it what what reel do you like oh yeah what so, size and what size what course. line and so yeah so this is uh i like these reels right here especially for my charters this is a, this is a pen spin fisher 6500 yep. it's not too big i mean there's these reels are, are great for what i do because you can just beat them up you know you can beat the crap out of them um get them wet whatever and uh i've got this i've got them loaded typically 65 pound braid um now some guys will use a little bit of a bigger reel which is good too um uh, and an 80 uh you know there, there's certain types of fishing in the bay and stuff like that in those bigger schools where you don't necessarily have to cast a mile um 65 is like a good all around. If I was going to have one roll, one rig, it'd be an eight foot rod, 65 pound test and that size reel, 6,500. Um, you can go bigger than that in like 80 pound. And some guys even use an eight and a half or even a nine foot rod. You'll see these guys, uh, some of the guys up on the towers that have like a leader that's 15, 20 feet long under their cork and they do, they spin around and then they'll, they'll cast. And it's a, it's a great way to have a nice long leader. And that works really well for those fish that are like uh, deep in the bay. Uh, that way you can, you can have a leader that's 
20 feet long underneath the cork. And that way that cork is going down. And, you know, if it's 30 feet deep in the tarpener, 10 feet to the bottom, it's sitting right in their face. And that's, that's a great way to do it. But that's like a very specialized kind of thing. Tyler, um, I got to yeah. say, honestly, I, I, uh, I have 30 pound on my setups. I never thought about going heavier on, on mainline. Oh yeah. What, what are some of the advantages? Cause I know you do lack a little bit on casting distance when you sure. bump up in your, in your main line for braid, it might not be that much, but what are some advantages you find to having a, a heavier braid, especially if you're fishing off the beach and you don't really have structure per se and capacity is kind of, kind of the mindset. Um, I mean, there's, it's definitely intentional. It sounds like that's the standard. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and like, I have a couple setups that I'll go down to 50 on, on the beach, 50, 50 braid just for casting. You know, if I was like long distance casting, I want to get a little bit more out of them, but in general, I mean, 30 pound is, is I, I actually started, you know, when I first started guiding 10, 12 years ago, I had 30 pound on some of my stuff just for casting distance. The problem is over and over again, um, you'll it's, there is no structure on the beach for the fish to get into, but there's other fish for the fish to get into. So when you're fighting a fish, they, you know, you first hook them, they freak out and jump, and then they go right back into the school. If there's a school of 50, hundred, whatever, this, the, the tarpon will go right back into the school and you'll feel the line going, boom, 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 boom. it's like bumping off the other fish. And if you've got 30 pound braid, if it hits their mouth at all, you're going to get cut off. Um, and, and the 30 pound, you're going to sit there generally and, and fight that you can't, you know, put as much pressure on the fish and you're going to fight them for a lot longer with 50 or even 65. It, you're going to, you know, you can put some serious heat on the fish and get them in quick. It's better for the fish. And then you can go get another one. So it's, it's more, you know, I, I never, it's extremely rare. I don't say never, cause it happens on some really big ones. But it's very, very rare to fight a fish for more than an hour on my boat. Um, typically, it's it's you know that ten to thirty minute time frame on you know fighting the fish because it's you just want to get them, get them in, and then go see if you can get another one. And like I said, it's it's way better for the fish to just to get them in quick. But basically, what we're doing throughout the fight is I have a little bit of a lighter drag during the hook hookup, so that fish is gonna you know, bite, then he's inevitably more than likely every fish is a little bit different, but typically they freak out and run and jump and go crazy for the first minute or two. And then they'll kind of settle into the fight and bulldog. And then they might surge and jump a couple more times. Um, and then, you know, slowly bulldog to the boat. Uh, so as that, that initial freak out, i I almost have it, you know, it's, it's a little bit heavier than what you'd use for snook and redfish on the flats but not much. I mean, it's pretty, pretty light of a drag just because that fish is going to be going insane all over the place. You don't want to put too much tension while they're in full fight or flight mode to, to pull the hook out or, or pop the line or whatever. And then as the fight you know, goes on, I'll crank the drag a half a crank every, you know, 10 minutes or so, five, 10 minutes, give them a little bit more. Once the fish slows down, crank the drag down. So by the end of the fight, the drag's really, really heavy. Um, now that's, you know, for my clients, now typically what I do when I'm fighting the fish, I leave the drag pretty loose the entire time. And I use my hand. That's like that way when the fish goes and he jumps, you know, you may not, if he jumps 10 feet that way, you're not going to have enough to bow all the time. If the drag is kind of loose, I can let go with my hand and, and let that fish run. There's not a whole lot of tension on there. And then when, as soon as he hits the water, come right back on them, you know, and, and really grab a spool. So I'm all, almost locking it down with my hand the entire time, applying maximum pressure. I don't do that with clients because you got to know how much you can apply and, and you got to know when to let go. If that fish surges, you got to let go. But once you kind of get experienced enough, you fight enough fish to know what your tackle can handle using your hand is a big one. And, and even like sometimes, so tarpon will, a lot of times when they slow down and get into the fight and they're slowly swimming away they might just be slowly pulling the drag out just like click 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 click. you know just just a little bit and they're not really running they're just kind of swimming around that's when i'll have my guys kind of thre thread the spool with their finger a little bit and just stop that slow pull because you either want to be gaining line on the fish or you want that fish to be 
surging and jumping and taking off. Not that the slow pull, you can sit there all day and you're just walking the dog, you know, you got to either be getting some on them or you got to be making them work extra hard. And, you know, I don't know if you want to get into more talking about the fight and that kind of thing. Now we can go into that later, but I'd love to hear you touched on it earlier, how you avoid the sharks. It happens to a lot of people, especially you, you get someone on your boat and it's their first time tarpon fishing and they're almost there. And all of a sudden the whole thing just turns into chaos and blood. And, um, how do how do you prevent, or I, I know it's impossible to prevent it, but how do you help avoid some of the shark stuff and just overall conservation to try to make sure, sure. you re- safely release as many tarpon as possible? Sure. Sure. So last year we only had, we had two tarpon lost to sharks total which is really good i mean yeah. it's not good to have any loss like but there's there are definitely ways around it right so and last year it seems like every year the bull sharks are getting more and more numerous i don't know what that is but last year was like insane there were so many sharks to the point that those big schools i was talking about that generally formed the bay just didn't really form because they there were so many sharks in the bay that the fish would go into the bay and we're like nope and they just go right back up. <laughs> so it was last year was, I don't know if it was an anomaly or what, but there were a lot of sharks. Uh, but anyway, so the way do you avoid them? You can kind of tell when a, sh- a shark is on your fish, you know, they, the fish has the initial freak out and runs and jumps and then settles into the fight. And he might surge and jump one, you know, throughout the fight a few times, but they generally don't like when they settle in and they're bulldogging when you're fighting them, they generally don't just switch directions and start running around spastically under the water. You know, it's something like you can, that's when you know there's probably a shark on them. If all of a sudden your fish freaks out and takes off and starts switching directions really fast in the middle of the fight, it's kind of like, oh, that's kind of weird. It's probably a shark on them. And, you know, you see, you just saw one and he's trying to get away. So what you can do is immediately either open the spool or completely loosen the drag. So usually what I'll do is just, or open the bale rather, just open the bale and just let that fish run and just let him go, right? So generally they will, if it's not at the, unless it's at the very end of the fight, which is, there's not a whole lot you can do then, but generally the fish can outrun the shark and he'll take off, you know, 200 yards of line as the spool is open and lines flying off, we'll try and loosen the drag almost completely just so there's a, just a tiny bit of tension. Once the fish is well away, close the bale and then start reeling and then motor towards that fish as fast as you can, right? So you're, you just pick up, the, you pick up that, all that line and you motor right at them and I'll just have my guy sit, you know, sit in the front of the boat and just reel up all that line. It might be 200 yards away or more. Um, you know, close the bail back down, real, real, just keep up just enough tension, even though if the lines, the drag's going out or whatever, as long as you're picking up some line, um, you're good. And just, then you go and get right on top of the fish. You just keep reeling until you're literally right on top of them and then hammer the drag down almost to where it's locked and just pull up as hard as you can and see. And, and a lot of times after that, the fish is done. He just, he's, he's halfway through the fight. He just ran big time. He freaked out. If he's not done, Loosen the drag, you know, back down a little bit, like normal fighting tension, and continue to fight the fish. If he, if the shark finds him again, just repeat the process. Open the bale, let the fish run. But what typically happens, you know, generally when there's sharks around, there's a big school of tarpon around, and it's it's likely that, you know, you stuck a fish out of that school or, or somewhere nearby. That school is sitting there, like you know, in a big ball like that you hook the fish and he runs way away from it, the shark's going to lose that tarpon and he's going to go back to the school. So then your, your tarpon is out there by itself and it's much less likely to get hit than he, he was right in that, you know, because all those sharks are just right around that big school of tarpon. So at the end of the fight, it can be a little bit more difficult because the fish is tired. They're not as aware. They don't have the ability to just run full speed away a lot of times. And what you can do then is same thing, loosen the drag so the fish can run. So typically they'll come up and hit them on the surface. The tarpon comes up, the bull shark or, or hammerhead is right behind them. This is a little bit more risky, but what you do is 
literally, you know, you see them and you take the boat and just have your guy. I have my guy reel, whoever it is, reel as fast as you can with a very loose drag. You run right in between the tarpon and the shark and you do circles around the tarpon with the boat really fast. And that just creates a create like bubbles and disturbance and all this stuff. And it creates like a bubble net around the tarpon. You just go like that right around the tarpon. It's it's intense and it's crazy. And you got to make sure no one falls out of the boat because that's like it's the worst place you could fall out of the boat. Yeah. But it you know you do this bubble net around the tarpon and then then lock the drag down and get them in quickly. And then the shark and all that disturbance and stuff, the shark will lose lose track of the tarpon. And then, you know, you can try and go drag them somewhere away from the school or drag them somewhere safe as you're reviving them. And let them kids, go. kids listening at home, do option one. Don't do the bubble <laughs> yeah, net. <laughs> yeah. yeah, bubble net takes a little bit more of a, a little more experience <laughs> and stupidity sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've actually accidentally like whacked the shark a couple of times and like, you know, but even then after hitting them, they will still come after the tarpon. They just, they're so yeah. tough. They don't even seem to care. It's crazy. <laughs> Luke, Justin, what else you got? I had a question when you're throwing, when you're throwing smaller crabs, are you still using the big hook or do you size down for, for smaller baits? And, uh, and also like what size crabs are you usually using? Sure. So in general, we use a pretty small crab. Uh, you know, you think a tarpon is a big fish that they're going to eat a big crab. But, you know, it's pretty rare that I'll put on a crab that's, that's like, you know, it's kind of hard to get a size range here, but basically like, so your cell phone, right? A lot, you'll see a lot of blue crabs that are the size of your cell phone. If they're that size or bigger, I'm probably not using them. Even, even a big crab, past crab, that size are smaller. Like if they're really hungry, they'll eat a nice big one. But the typical good size is about the size of a silver dollar. That's like, that's like the money size right there. But sometimes they will eat a, they, they want the crabs that are like the size of a quarter. I mean, I've seen them out there just slurping these little bitty crabs off the surface and they won't even look at the, at the bigger ones. It's like so weird when these little, it's those little purple pink pass crabs. There's, there's basically, there's three main types that you'll see in the passes. You've got the, the reddish brown kind. You've got the purple pink kind. They're a little bit smaller with the longer claws. And then you've got your blue crabs. Um, there are a couple other ones also. They're more rare and they all work. But the purple ones are, are much more fragile than, than the other species. Um, a, a nice big reddish brown pass crab like that is, is money because they, they're very lively. They last a, a pretty long time. Um, or, like a, or a small blue crab is, is extremely lively as well that's that's my preferred one on the beach is, is a small blue crab but I, you know it's it's funny i it, in the past is a lot of times i've seen if they're spooky or whatever they will hit a red or a purple pass crab five to one over a blue i don't know i have no idea why right mm -hmm. i just know that that's true yeah there you go that's the purple yeah. guy it's kind of i mean for a lot of people that are you know hear about crabs hear about pass crabs that's that's traditionally what a pass crab would look like but yeah over dollar size it's hard to see in the picture but their legs are kind of like this iridescent purplish pink mm -hmm. um, they have kind of the markings all throughout the whole body but when people ask and they think about oh it's gonna try to show it up there they think about crabs they think about blue crabs and it's a totally different yeah thing, you know yep yeah. and you'll the, basically the only way to get them you can buy them at the bait store if you wanted to you can catch them yourself though and they they flow out around the full and the new moons on big outgoing tides uh, in any of the passes, uh, especially the Egmont Channel, you know, Skyway, uh, Pass Grill, the big outgoing tides, they, all these crabs will come up off the bottom and they, they come right to the surface and they flow out. And you, you'll see everybody out there with big dip nets just scooping them up off the top. Um, now, the one he showed was a purple pass crab, which definitely works, but they're probably the, the lesser of the, th of the three in general because they just they just don't seem to last on a hook very well yeah that's that's the red variety so that's a red and like that you'll see the reddish kind of brown that's a really good one so if you look on the side of their carapace there um there's those two little white dots that's basically where you want the hook to go through you're hooking them in the like on the point of those care of the carapace right there 
Yeah. If, if you look, you'll see on the underneath part of the crab, there's we'll a little around Justin. Yeah, I know. I wish you had a real crab, <laughs> but underneath on the belly, if you look around the rim of their carapace, you'll see just inside of that little rim of the carapace, there's another little white line where their gut cavity just kind of starts. And that's, that's where you want to put you, you when you hook the crab, that's where you want to put it through. You don't want to put it too far in at all because it will injure their internal organs and the crab won't last nearly as long. You just, I mean, you're basically coming in just a few millimeters and the way to hook them is you don't just want to try and push the hook through because it will likely crack the carapace of the shell and just, and then the crab's going to die or whatever. He's no good. So what you do is you, you want to take the hook point and screw it in like this until it works its way through. Just keep screwing that hook point in you know, just work it through and all of a sudden it'll, the barb will pop through and then, and then you're good to go. And one thing that I'll do, it's really good is, is I'll take a, a little bucket, you know, you can buy when you buy shrimp or whatever, you get these little, little buckets that are not the size of a five gallon, but whatever, it's a small one. And I'll have a little bucket on the front of the boat with a crab in it, hooked up, ready to go. So that way, you know, if you see the fish, it's not like, oh, there's the fish. Like got to go and dig a crab out of the well. And then you got to wiggle the hook through just right. And then all oh, the fish are already gone. <laughs> you know, I'll have like one or two of those crabs, like on a hook, ready to rock. So, um, you know, even in the live well, I don't, I'll keep one in the live well in the back maybe. And then the crab on the front, especially when we're out there sight fishing. Like I don't like to just drag them in the water because then, then they're trying to swim the whole time and they're getting tired definitely keep them in a bucket. So they're just resting and they're like hundred percent fresh. That way you get them in front of the tarp and they're really dancing around and, and then you'll get that bite. Um, and so on those, uh, on those like silver dollar to quarter size, what? Oh yeah. The hook. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, at certain times I will definitely go down in hook size and I'll use a little J hook. I'll use like a, like a, a five aught, you know, uh, octopus hook or something like that. Um, because, like I said, there are certain times when that's what they want. Some of those really spooky days, um, I'll, I'll go down, you know, go down with a little J hook and you, you basically set the hook just the same as you would a circle, hook, just reel, you know, point the rod right at them and reel. Um, that way, those, those little octopus hooks, you can't put as much tension on them as a bigger circle hook, but they help keep the crab, those the smaller crabs alive and which is what it's all about. And, and you know, you, you'll still catch way more fish that if you impale them with a big eight out hook that's like the size of the crab i mean and it just it does work but it doesn't work nearly as well it's a much smaller kind of octopus style hook is what i'll use on those guys cool yeah what else justin you got anything else no this is this is an overwhelming amount of information i know I'm, yeah, i mean awesome. I, I've, I've got a lot i love more, it but... <laughs> you know you i mean we've addressed leader size we've addressed hook size you know the type of rod reel combination you need to go out and do it the things you got to look for throughout different times of the year right you've got this one and a half to two month window and the fish kind of stage and do different things throughout the year and the whole thing i'm thinking you know i know we do have people that the west coast tarpon the gulf tarpon do not behave the same way as an east coast no, atlantic they tarpon they even though they're both technically megalops atlanticus they are not the same fish no. they don't have the same behavior and and it's a whole different it's a whole different ballpark you know a lot of what i do is nighttime fishing with 125 pound leader and artificials you know at certain parts on the east coast of florida and you know, bait migrations are different, bait profiles are different, setups are different, and the behavior is different. Um, as a baseline, I've always loved, and you know, through my whole life being a, a Florida native, have wanted to get onto that beach migration on the West Coast because it is a lot of fish. It's a daunting amount of fish, and the water's so clear. It's a very visual sport, and it's really like gets your adrenaline pumping. But when you do it on the East Coast, people that do travel and, and try to get on different bites. We'll notice that in general, the fish on the East Coast aren't as pressured, but at the same time, there's not as many fish too, unless it's like the mullet run or a minnow run where they're piled up on baits on the beach and just, you know, blitzing baits, but it's a totally different fishery, but a lot of these things are applicable. I'm thinking now as, you know, people travel and target different species in different areas, 
um, a lot of those techniques, you know, roll over, you know, the, the, you, the rigging and the size of the hook you're using for the type of the bait is always something to consider the heavier line. I mean, I never thought about that. I never thought about having a heavier line as a means of abrasion resistance when you're hooking fish in schools and run the risk of having that braid get chopped. And I think yeah. that's, that's really smart. I never thought yeah. about that. Yeah. You know, a lot of us here that have been fishing our whole lives, we're still learning tidbits, you know, from a professional like yourself to go out and be more successful. So I'm like, I'm soaking it all in, man. I think this is sure. awesome. Good. And definitely that, uh, that little uni knot on the hook will help you guys over there if you're slow trolling mullet or whatever, something like that. That's a good oh, one. Yeah. You know? sure. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And then it sounds like, you know, I think we did a video. I think I did it with, with my, my kids and Luke, we did one about just catching past crabs. And so we got the full in the, in the new moon, outgoing tide so it sounds like if you're a weekend warrior and you're trying to pick a couple times over the next few months to go tarpon fishing would you pick those two times uh, uh if, if if you happen to have the ability to pick your uh, your times yeah sure i mean you know it's it's definitely not a secret that around the full and the new moons in june um and in, in, you know may june july uh that the fish will stack up at Egmont, um, Passage Key, and Bean Point, and it's it's not it's probably the easiest time to catch a tarpon because um, all you have to do is go out to these areas on the outgoing tide, which is always in the afternoon, and once once the crabs start flowing, eventually, you know, like, like I said, those big schools of tarpon move up into the bay and they come through. Eventually, that big school of tarpon is going to make its way past Egmont or Passage Key or whatever. And those tarpon are going to spread out and most likely start feeding on the pass crabs. So literally all you have to do in those times is net a pass crab out of the water, hook it on, just like I showed you and throw it out and drift. And you can just drift, you know, throw it out there and drift. And then all of a sudden, boom, you'll get a bite. It's not, it's really not that difficult of a time to catch one. That's, that's why you'll, they'll, they'll, there's going to be a, a lot of people out there doing it too. Yep. And there's certain things to do um, to make sure that you're not drifting up on other people and, you know, make sure you're not running through all the other boats. The one thing I will say, if you're going to go out there and do it on those days, there's definitely an etiquette is you'll see everybody's drifting in the same kind of zone. Once you finish your drift, you go, you want to go way outside the drift and come way out around everybody and then start to drift up front and then work your way back through see these guys blasting through all the other boats or cutting through people and stuff like that. And it just like ruins the fishing for everybody. Yeah. So you want to definitely, you know, drift for everybody's drifting in the same spot and then go way out around and, and, you know, make sure you're, you're taking your turn. Try not to cut anybody off. You see people with lines out, you don't want to come in right in front of them or right on top of their line just, and cut them off go, go in front and drift with everybody else. That's yeah, the I keep seeing that fish behind you. It looks like a tarpon profile yeah. until I see the tail come to the other side. Yeah, he's about half tarpon. That's uh, <laughs> it's an arowana. They're pretty sweet. It's an That's unfair a... advantage to sit and watch them all day. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one, he's pretty one, cool. One question I have on the crab. So when you catch your own, are you are you taking both claws off? Like claws off, claws on? Have you seen a difference one way or the other? Sure. So actually what I do, what I like to do, because I like to keep the crabs as healthy as possible, is I'm actually just taking the, the pincer off, the top pincer. So I, I oh, didn't mean to flick you off. Oh, hey, 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 this is a family, family show, <laughs> Tyler. Tyler. <laughs> oh, wait, let me yeah. sneak that in here. Right, wait. I just take the top <laughs> pincer off like that. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, my bad. But yeah, so you just that take, is. and I just basically take that pincer and, and pull it up. So it leaves the claw on. Hmm. Um, that way it leaves the crab as healthy as possible basically. And it also, there's a little bit more action on the crab. So when the crabs, when the crab swims one way, he's like doing a dab, right? So he goes like this and he goes like that. So it's a little bit more action, a little bit more motion. So um, it, if he's got no claw, it still works and he's swimming around and stuff, but just that little bit of an extra dose of reality, maybe it makes a difference, maybe not. But uh, that's, that's what I, I generally will keep the claws on all a lot of times you know you'll pop that off and they'll drop the claw anyway but uh typically that's what i'll do sweet that's awesome man we'll yeah. definitely have to uh, book you again 
this uh this summer and uh do one yeah. of these live out in, uh, on the water yeah. that'd be a blast yeah for sure for sure i mean that would, that would be a blast yeah it's it should be it should be good it's already kind of uh there's a lot of fish out there already at the skyway we've had kind of a warmer spring since it busted loose in in march and we've landed a number of fish already and i've marked a ton out there and uh it's shaping up to be a, a, a good good season there's, they're catching a lot of fish that bounce south already and Every year, it seems like there's more fish, so we should be in great shape. Yep, love it. Well, hopefully, Luke, you get on a couple there in uh, Buckle Grand. We got the Island Rada trip coming up soon. So yeah, are they are they down there on the beach already? No, yeah, I haven't, or I haven't even been off. I've just been out here for a couple of days, and okay. it's been howling. It's it's oh, finally okay. coming up to get out, and then so I'll, I'll go stink out. But the fact that the crabs are starting to flush out, I'm, I have to imagine there's some around. Yeah, it's got to be but, some. Uh, but yeah, we have a bay boat now, so I'll be out there after them. This yeah, summer. I've seen so, you out there running around. <laughs> cool man cool but, well where can everyone follow you i know uh, instagram yeah instagram if you type in at captain dash tyler dash capella or if you, if you just type in captain tyler on instagram i'm the first one that pops up um that's that that's the best place my hit uh charter company is hit and run fishing charters uh but again instagram is that's like if i catch anything i'm always doing posting stories and like catch anything that day pretty much po i'm posting stuff all the time that's where i'm most active so Instagram's the way to go, but also yeah. on Facebook. Yeah, def definitely follow Captain Tyler and uh, book him. Book him for a trip. We did it, uh, I guess, two different times, and uh, we had our, our buddies there, uh, John, yeah, and yeah, James, those guys. <laughs> the twins, and yeah, uh, you know they really wanted to go out and catch some some big redfish and, and snook. And uh, you know sometimes when you're entertaining, like you don't also want to be trying to have to peel on fish. Like we're gonna hire Tyler. And you got both those guys on their first red fish and first snook, big ones too. Yeah, nice. And we had ones. an absolute blast and just caught a ton of fish. So it was, yeah. it was fun. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, it was a blast. Well, hopefully we can get you guys out there. I know, uh, God, if this July is anything like last July, it's going to be, um, you know, amazing. So if, I'm, I'm, I look forward to tarpon season as soon as it's over. You know, that's, that's my <laughs> favorite fish of fishing. I love, I love, I can, I can hunt tarpon all day for 12 hours a day, every day. I just love it. Yeah. So there's nothing like it. Cool. Awesome. Well, brother, thank you again for taking the time to do this. Yeah, you and bet, man. Everyone make sure to go follow Captain Tyler and then leave us questions at saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. We put every one of these episodes right there in the fishing tip section and leave us a comment that comes right to us. And if it's something that's specific to him, we'll forward it over to him. And uh, if you have any, uh, any other thoughts on this and we'll probably do, I think, you know, Justin towards the end, you started talking about, east coast that would be interesting even doing just on because i know we we're talking about fly we we're going to do a little fly fishing i feel like each one of those could be its own segment uh because yeah. there's just so many little nuances so uh, i think oh, we yeah. could do some canals. more canals would be a good one too those are yeah. those are, like those are a whole different ball game those those yeah. fish would drive me crazy those yeah. i know yeah <laughs> they're pretty picky oh yeah yep cool guys well enjoy the rest of the week thank you captain tyler you bet and, uh, we will uh, see you out in the water thank All you right, my pleasure guys thanks a see lot you guys